Good evening. Hello. I'm uh, Karen Taylor. I'm exec I am the program director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the final lecture of the Labour, Literature and Landmark Lecture Series. The Labour, Literature and Landmark Lectures are supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. For those of you who this might be your first visit, some background information on the General Society. Uh, the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York is a non-profitable organization that was founded in 1785 by the skilled craftsmen of that time. 22 artisans founded the General Society. Uh, today, this 229-year-old organization continues to serve and improve the quality of life of the people of the City of New York through its educational, philanthropic and cultural programs, including its tuition-free Mechanics Institute, the library of which, of course, you're in now, and its nearly 200-euro lecture series, of course, of which tonight's lecture is part of. Before introducing tonight's panelists, I want to remind you that there will be a short wine and cheese reception after tonight's event, which we hope you will stay for. And now I just want to say something um, about our panel. Um, it is a particular delight and honor to have uh, Europa Editions here this evening. Kent Carroll, uh, the publisher, has been here on other occasions, but not for quite a few years, so I have to say it is an absolute personal delight to have him back here. Europa Editions is an independent publisher of literary fiction, non-fiction, and high-end crime fiction based in New York and London. It is renowned for publishing exceptional books with a distinctive imprint. Publisher Kent Carroll was formerly the direct, editorial director at Grove Press and also publisher and editor-in-chief at Carroll and Graf Publishers. He will lead tonight's panel discussion. Joining Kent will be three Europa edition authors. Uh, Jesse Browner, the writer of Everything Happened Today, which I just happen to have here. I'm sure you can guess, possibly, which one might be Jesse. And uh, next we have uh, Audrey Schulman, and she will be reading from her book Three Weeks in December. And finally, we have Michelle Zakem, uh, who will be reading from Last Train to Paris. And very importantly, I want to mention that these all these books will be for sale after tonight's event, and I'm sure the authors would be happy to sign them. Kent, just to give you an overview of what the panel discussion is, how it's going to go tonight, Kent is going to start. He'll um, kick off the discussion, and he's going to talk about his industry experience. He's going to compare independent and corporate publishing throughout the years and reflect or prophesize, I should say, the future of independent publishing in an era of corporate mergers. Um, he's also going to talk about digital books, and he's going to discuss the thorny impact of Amazon on the industry. Mm -hmm. um, audience, you, I should say, will have the opportunity to pose questions to Kent uh, and the Europa authors, who will also be reading extracts from their books as the evening will conclude with the Q&A. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you now Kent Carroll. Thank you very much, um, Karen. It's a pleasure to be here and welcome to all of you. Um, Karen has outlined how this will proceed and so I can, instead of introducing my friends, admirable authors, I'll go directly to the story I have to tell. We publishers live now in interesting times and some might even think too interesting. Certainties abound, but those who make claims today may find their predictions on the slag heap of history tomorrow. I'm not a historian, I'm a publisher. I've had several decades of experience with the world of trade books. Tonight I've been asked to talk about the evolution of the publishing business in New York. In the interest of time, I've reluctantly left out some antidotes about the publishing business. The one about Barney Rossett editing a manuscript with a pair of scissors, 
And there's also the one about the uh, controversial memoir I bought for $1 that was reviewed on the editorial pages of the New York Times and became a huge bestseller. Back to the topic for tonight. I'll begin with what we seem to know. Most independent publishers are privately owned. The major publishers are generally publicly owned. Bertelsmann, a German company which owns Random House, is a limited partnership. Hachette, which owns Little Brown, among many others, is a subsidiary of a large publicly traded conglomerate with headquarters in Paris. Independent publishers grow by attempting to increase sales. Public publishers, the major publishers, grow by merger. I can remember when Random House was just Random House. When I was, I, I was at Grove, our turnover was about $5 million a year. Random House, this is 1970, 1971. Random House was about 20 million, four times our size. Today, Random House has 50 separate imprints. All five of the majors are about 50 times larger than most of the independent publishers. Independents can't compete with the majors for established authors or the most promising new authors, both of, which, both of whom command large advances. Independents say pay generally between, say, five and $20,000 for most of their new books. They'll occasionally go higher to retain a successful author, but only with great care. The majors pay into the millions. So the independents operate on a be careful, husband your resources business model. Many want, just want to stay alive. For the majors, it's a mass market bestseller model. Everything, distribution, publicity, promotion, is front loaded. It used to be that bestsellers required multiple printings. I can remember in Grove, and we had a book called The Games People Play, which was a bestseller, for a year and a half, and we went through something like 75 printings. Now they're very often for established writers in this mass market bestseller um, arrangement that they have is that there'll only be one printing. They'll print 600,000 books, never have to go back to print. Bestsellers can be both a bonus and a bane for independence. Well, let me see where I have. Oh, it used to be that bestsellers required multiple printings. Now there, there is often only one, which I've said. Some major publishers lose money on three out of every four books they publish. But that fourth book is often a, a bestseller that earns a multiple of the amount the other three lose. Bestsellers can be both a bonus and a bane for independence. The difficulty for a small company is the unlikely expectation that lightning will strike again and that on the expectation of the avalanche of cash is spent rather than saved. A lot of small publishers have gone out of business because they had a, a big success, and rather than uh, invest it or save it, uh, they thought they'll have this kind of success every year, and they didn't. Simon & Schuster, on the other hand, can count on having 75 to 125 bestsellers a year. Small some small publishers only have one. For an independent publisher, safety arrives when at least 40% of earnings come from the backlist, rights and sales. A large independent publisher might release 100 books a year, a combination of new titles and reprints. A major such as Random House or Hachette publishes 1,000 books a year. The major companies are diversified, publishing a wide range of books in a variety of formats. They can also take on debt, sell stock, borrow money something that independent publishers generally cannot do. Whether independent or major, book publishing is an activity that employs hundreds of thousands of people. It's international. The largest publishers have a turnover of hundreds of millions of dollars a year. But except for the top executives and a few leading agents and popular authors, it doesn't pay very well. And to boot, its future in the digital world is precarious and yet it continues to attract some of the most capable, well-educated young men and women. Why? For two reasons, I think. It is an endlessly interesting and stimulating population that allows us to spend our days with something we love, reading and the continual conversation about books. For many people in the publishing business, there is scant distinct, distinction between their professional and their public lives. The second reason, seldom mentioned, I think, 
is that a life in book publishing offers the possibility of secondary immortality, at least for a generation or two. Think of Maxwell Perkins, Bennett Cerf, Barney Rossett. We still speak of them because they published Hemingway and Fitzgerald, James Joyce and Marcel Proust, Samuel Beckett and Allen Ginsberg. The question remains, however, is publishing actually a business? At a dinner some time ago, I sat next to a fellow who had a senior position in one of our leading investment firms. He was an interesting, articulate man, and I was curious about his business. So we spent most of the meal with him talking, me asking questions and listening. Just before the dessert, he apologized for monopolizing our conversation and asked what line I was in. I told him books. He smiled and posed some probing questions. I answered as best I could. After about 10 minutes, he shook his head. Let's see if I have this right. He said, trade publishing is largely unpredictable from one year to the next. You sell on consignment. Your assets can walk out the door. You have no pricing power. And the competition is brutal. He hesitated. That's not a business you're in. That's a hobby. A wonderful hobby, to be sure, but not a business anybody I know would ever invest in. So why did I jump into this world? I'd been in New York about a year, during which time I worked for a movie studio. Uh, and when their publicity department, entire department, including myself, was fired, I was hired by the show business weekly Variety. At Variety, my beat included the New York Film Festival. In that year, 1969, Grove Press, who was in the film as well as the book and magazine business, had three or four entries at the festival. It fell to me to review them. One of them was Marguerite Duras, Destroy, she said. Marguerite was a very important, well-known French author who made a few films and Grove published. I thought it elegant and witty and gave it an overly favorable review. When I met Barney Rossett, the man who owned Grove, at a festival party, he told me he hadn't a clue what the film was about until he read my review and wondered if I would be interested in coming to work for him. I hesitated a second or two for effect and said yes. Six weeks later, I was having dinner with Marguerite in Paris. That was the beginning of a fabulous ride, my tenure, tenure at Grove, where I worked with Jean-Luc Godard, Samuel Beckett, Norman Mailer, Mailer Gilbert Sorrentino, and acquired and published a confederacy of dunces, amongst many others. Grove was the perfect 50s and 60s example of both the strength and weakness of independent publishing. However, its independence supported a culture and attracted a staff that was committed to books that could affect how we thought and behaved, socially, politically, sexually. Books that would last. A few examples, Last Exit to Brooklyn, City of Night, The Master and Margarita, the works of the Marquis de Sade, Jean Genet, William Burroughs, Henry Miller. It was a very unusual time in the, early, the late 60s, early 70s in New York. And one of the things when I was putting this together, I thought about, I have interns who work for me, wonderful people who we can't do without. They have roommates and live in Brooklyn. When I came to New York, I got a job at a newspaper. Um, paid me $175 a week. I got a one-bedroom apartment in the West Village. It was $150 a month. A hamburger with french fries and a salad plus a large tankard of beer was 90 cents. A different time, a different economy. I left Grove in 1981. In the late 70s, we had had a couple of bestsellers. Um, a rather remarkable book, which some of you may remember, My Story by Judith Exner, and also the above-mentioned Confederacy of Dunces, which became a bestseller for a, a, more than a year. And those two books kept us alive for a couple of years. But the magic was gone. Times had changed. Books that only Grove would have published a decade, be decade before were now in the lists of the large, con more conventional trade houses. I left. After, recuperating, after a recuperative holiday of six months, I wanted to return to publishing. But given, given my experiences and independence at Grove, I felt unfit to work in an established house. Also, I didn't want to be an employee. So I enlisted a partner, a gifted salesman who I knew at Grove, and on the strength of our reputations, we quickly assembled a list of 10 titles for which I paid a total of $2,000 in advances. 
Half of that money went to one novel um, called Gardens of Stone, which had languished for months and months with an editor, an agent I knew. Because of my association with a lot of the suppliers from Grove, I was able to make very good deals with printers, uh, brokered a favorable agreement with a new dis distributor. Bookstores were interested in seeing us uh, succeed, so they ordered uh, interesting number of, a valuable number of, of, of books on the first list. There wasn't enough money to pay ourselves or rent an office, but we survived and soon began to thrive. And Gardens of Stone was instrumental. It's a, it's a novel set in, about Vietnam, but it's set in Washington, D.C. Um, we sold about 30,000 copies in hardcover, which was a lot of copies then, certainly for us. I sold the paperback rights for $100,000. And then Francis Coppola bought the movie rights and made a film, and it was a successful film. And the fact of the film created much more demand for the book. So we had a flow of royalties for two years that, that uh, didn't allow us to pay ourselves any money, but at least we could pay our bills and we could rent a small office. Carolyn Graff went on to have 20 years of steady expansion, in large part because we had a sound business plan, as well as editorial aspirations. By 1985, we were publishing 75 cloth and paper books a year, an important number, and an important number of which were reissues of remarkable novels that had gone out of print. It was, a, it was a, quite an interesting time. All of these, really, dozens of wonderful novels. I mean, so I bought reprint rights to, to a number of books by J.G. Ballard, Penelope Fitzgerald, Philip K. Dick. Um, and there was, there was a, a, an audience then as there is now for those. It was a period of transition. The large conservatively managed companies were growing by acquiring small income, smaller companies. Penguin bought Viking and Dutton. Random House bought Knopf and Pantheon. Started Crown. These relative, relative behemoths had become increasingly dependent on the chain stores, whose opening orders could be in the tens of thousands, a retail strategy that encouraged the mass market bestseller model employed by the majors. It also left, it also left room for smaller publishers with more ideas than money. Carolyn Graff pro prospered in large part because we published can't-miss commercial nonfiction, such, such as the Mammoth book, books, oversized, underpriced trade paperbacks on every subject that has a built-in audience, from unsolved mysteries to battles of World War I to zombies. I slowly built, built a list of literary fiction, but not until we were financially secure and I could make offers on novels that would attract criti critical attention, even if they might not earn back costs for a while. After 20 years, my partner decided that he wanted to cash out. So we sold the company, which is immediately went into to decline and was within a couple of years dismantled. Carolyn Graff had been profitable, our backlist was flourishing, and I had assembled a stable of important authors. Yet it was a familiar circumstance to independent publishers, one from which the major, major companies are immune. Many independent publishers are main, maintained by a partnership. If one partner wants out, the company may fold or be sold. If the president of HarperCollins wants to quit, the company certainly carries on. So why did I get involved in another company, Europa? It, because I guess it's, it's in my blood, it's who I am, it's what I want to do. Sandra and Sandra Ferry and myself founded Europa in the summer of 2004, which makes this our 10th anniversary. I had been away from publishing for two years, reading for pleasure, travel, giving the occasional lecture, talks on the Queen Mary, resting. The woman in my life, then and now, Helen Whitney, had a glorious villa in Italy, which we visited whenever we had a few free weeks. Sandro and Sandra owned a distinguished publishing house in Rome that had grown to prominence by publishing fiction and translation, of which there in Italy there was a paucity 30 years ago. They believed that something similar could find a niche in the United States. An American agent they knew recommended me as a possible partner. The original idea was to only publish fiction and translation, but be perhaps because I speak and read only English, I didn't believe such a program could be self-sustaining. 
and, and less a third to a half of the books published were English language originals. After some discussion, they agreed and I joined them. In the beginning, it was clear to me that a new company needed, needed without much in the way of resources, without um, any history here in the United States, needed to distinguish itself quickly and survival for a new underfunded company with an unusual publishing program would be largely dependent on how fast we could brand ourselves. It took about a year, which was surprising even to me, to achieve distinction, two years for our brand to be recognized. And one of the, some of the things that we did is we used Italian designers for the covers. So they looked different from anything any American publisher was doing and they had a kind of uniformity to them such that a lot of bookstores would display the books simply because they liked the way they looked. And they, they would get face out display in a lot of places where ordinarily might have got spine out dis display. Um, we put the logo on the front cover, which American publishers generally almost never do, but is common in Europe. We used French flaps, which very few trade paperbacks do because it's more expensive. We had a uniform typeface, so it had, there was a uniform kind of a quality to it. And we used, we had a standard price. Um, and all together, it gave us an identity that proved to be quite valuable. The looks of the books, as I said, was enormously helpful. And from the beginning, the books were well displayed in the stores. Since we didn't have a budget for advertising or marketing, we required free publicity. And it came in the form of reviews in the most influential newspapers and magazines. The newspapers and magazines are target audience, which has is, is turned out to be essentially literate, educated women uh, who like to read fiction. We were also very fortunate in that on our first season, three of our novels, um, The Days of Abandonment by Elena Ferrante, who has become quite popular and, and increasingly well known here. The Booker Prize finalist, a, a wonderful comic novel called Cooking with Fernet Branca. And the classic Mediterranean noir, Total Chaos, were championed by the New York Times, The New Yorker, National Public Radio, The Washington Post, amongst others. And then, within a short time, Jane Gardam would come along. Um, and Jane Gardam, the book was Old Filth, which had been turned down by every major American publisher. And I was able to buy it, and she has been, become a staple on our, on our list in, since. The early public attention invest, invested us with a certain aura, a small new company where every book was worthy of consideration, one that would collect rave reviews and sell gener generously. Well, we didn't sell as generously as we had hoped, but the other part of that, that, that try ad was true. Europa works because of the review attention we receive and our standing with the independent bookstores that have survived. And therein lies some of the, the, the difficulty for all independents because their business model doesn't conform with the way in which the chain stores and now just Barnes and Noble or Amazon works. They're, they're uh, disproportionately dependent upon in, independent stores and that body sadly shrinks. We published because we were able to establish a brand, an identity, a look. Other independents have prospered because they specialize in certain categories, such as mysteries, where there's a huge demand and profitable niches. There's a company called Soho who, that does that very well. Some others are nonprofits or subsidized or have carved out a lucrative slot in offbeat nonfiction. And the Workman Publishing is a good example of the latter. Uh, they do things that nobody else even thinks of doing, and they've done them very successfully. The severe decline in bookstores, for the independents to be sure, but also for the chains, is, is a tragedy. Uh, a town without a bookstore seems spiritually incomplete. Barnes and Noble and Borders put a thousand independent bookstores out of business by carrying a vast inventory of titles which is good, but by heavily discounting their bestsellers. And which brings up something about the oddness of publishing. What other business takes 20 to 40% off 
it's best-selling merchandise. Generally, what goes on sale are the things that, that aren't moving, not the things that are selling best. The independents that have survived the onslaught, however, have learned to be far better at retail sales. The trouble is there just aren't enough of them. When I was at Grove, it was on University Place, and I lived where I do now in the West Village. I'd often walk home along 8th Street. In six blocks, there were seven bookstores, including a couple of the best in the city. And if I went east, from where Grove was on University Place, to 4th Avenue, there were a dozen secondhand and aquarium bookstores. Now there is one each way. The future will see more change, change that is difficult to predict. Five years ago, most of the trade publishers in New York, including the so-called Big Six, which now with the joining of Penguin and Random House are the Big Five, were in a dither because of the growing popularity of e-books. Where would it stop? What royalties do we pay? How do we split the revenues with the retailers? And perhaps most vital, how do we introduce new authors without physical books or bookstores? Today, the percentage of e-books e is stabilized, and the majors who, predict, who, who have predictable, regular bestsellers by established authors have been presented with a veritable bonanza. And that's because for the publisher, the value of e-commerce is that you don't have to manufacture the damn things. There's no shipping, there's no inventory, there's no unsold copies that have to be remaindered or sold below production cost. Therefore, the margins are greater, the profit larger, the entire process from formatting to sale is remarkably efficient with ebooks. But ebooks also pose a problem. They continue to threaten bookstores and encourage self publishing, and they are under the control, in large part, of a ruthless retailer. Amazon has already changed publishing twice first, by making any book in the world quickly available and secondly, by making e-books mainstream. But there are also a serious problem to most publishers. Just this week, our new collection of Jane Gardam stories has been published, and there's a feature article in, in The New Yorker, and there'll be another piece in The New York Times. There's this dramatic spike, spike in e-sales because you get these impulse buys. But Amazon, without notice, and for no apparent reason, cut the price from $10.99 to $7.99. Madness cheats the publisher and the author, and they're also cheating themselves. But we have literally no control over this. It used to be that on occasion, hab habitual readers of genre fiction, mostly romance and mystery, would become authors. They'd read a few dozen novels and say to themselves, I can do this, and some could. But back then, they had to find a publisher or an agent who could find a publisher for them, and they would be paid in advance. Today, all they need to do is pay Amazon $700, and given some luck or exquisite timing, occasionally a self-published book is noticed on the internet, sells tens of thousands of copies, and doing so reinforces the notion that old-fashioned procedures are no longer needed, that the readers among who are a few hundred who also want to give this writing business a try. There is an attractive democratic aspect to this phenomenon of self-publishing, but it doesn't cause more people to read or buy books, certainly not from bookstores, unless, of course, if the book is noticed and bought by a traditional publisher. And if it's Fifty Shades of Grey, gray there's an enormous amount of attention, but that simply inspires thousands of more people to self write and self-publish their own books. Um, let me just conclude with the way I feel about this. Over the years, I've personally witnessed dramatic changes in the publishing industry. Depending on the day, I felt excited, angry, fulfilled, relaxed, satisfied. I'm often reassured, reassured seeing in the subway, in the park, sitting in a tree, around their smartphones, young men and women concentrated, smiling, because they're reading. Even on those days when another bookstore is closed, I still believe print books will never be obsolete. People will always want to write and to read, and for many of them, the print tradition is sacred. It may not be much of a business, but it's certainly a grand life. Thank you.
Hey, I'm, okay, I'm Audrey Shulman, um, and I'm lucky enough to get published by Kent, who is incredible. Um, the first time I got, uh, I'll just, okay, good. Um, the, the first event I went to uh, as a Europa author, uh, everybody came up to me and they had no idea who I was and they didn't care. They only cared about Europa. You know, they'd be like, oh, you're so lucky. <laughs> uh, so it's an incredible imprint um, and I am lucky. Uh, I've been told to talk a little bit about where I got a, the idea for my book and then read a few pages uh, so that's what I'll do. Um, anybody read my book at all, just out of curiosity? So, okay, good. <laughs> um, uh, so, in general, I feel that writers uh, each have a few obsessions that they write best about. You know, like if you think of Hemingway, he would write about men who were really men and women who were really women. Um, and uh, you know, some violence. Um, and those were, that's when his writing became the very best, right, that it could be. And almost every writer is like that. So I also have my obsessions. In my case, they're, they, my writing tends to uh, reach another level when I write about foreign climates, when I write about wild animals, preferably very large ones, when I write about people who are physically different in some way, and where I write about violence. So in trying to figure out what my next book would be, um, I tried to come up with those four things, because then normally I can come up with a, a book that at least is as good as I can do. Um, so I decided I'd write about Africa, because it was a continent I had not yet written about. Um, and uh, whenever I write, I tend to do a lot of research. So I started reading all the books I could possibly find about Africa. And um, one of the first ones I read was The Man-Eaters of Tsavo, which is a historical story of uh, an engineer trying to build the railroad across what's now ke called Kenya. Um, and these two man-eating lions kill and eat over 100 people. And that's like, that's fact, right? That happened, and so I figured, Great, foreign climate, wild animals, violence. Um, so <laughs> I knew at least part of what I wanted the book to be about, and I decided um, that I wanted also to talk about colonialism in Africa. So I decided I'd have a second story which would happen 100 years later, so that there'd be the man-eaters story, which I would fictionalize, um, and uh, a more modern version. And I decided it would uh, have, to, have to do with uh, gorillas and have an ethnobotanist, which is somebody who um, finds uh, drugs in plants, right? So um, I, I, gear, I geared the story around that. Um, and it was, but her, her story, the second modern story, did not work because there, uh, I just couldn't get it to work. And I couldn't get it to work until finally one day I realized that she had um, Asperger's. And that, of course, would have been the fourth thing that I needed, the physical difference, right? So as soon as I gave, had a character that was with Asperger's slightly physically different than uh, neurotypicals, than, than, normal, uh, than people who are considered normal, um, the book came alive and it just uh, was some of the best writing I have ever been able to do. Um, so if you're a writer or you want to write, find your obsessions and, and go for them. I'll read a short bit from the very beginning um, and then uh, you'll get to hear the next writers. This is chapter one, Steamship Goliath, East Indian Ocean, December 7th, 1899. 300, 300 miles from Mombasa, the steamship Goliath happened upon an Arabian dhow, becalmed on the Indian Sea. The sail hung slack, the rope trailing loose, and no person was visible aboard. The steamer rumbled deep in its guts to begin its emergency halt. Carrying his iced tea, 
Jeremy got up from his lounge chair to walk to the railing where he could view the boat better. Even at eight in the morning, he narrowed his eyes as he stepped into the weight of the tropical sun. As the shadow of the steamer crept over the tiny wooden boat, its single sail slapped listlessly from side to side. Peering down, it took Jeremy a moment to make out the sprawled forms of five Mohammedans, their white robes appearing at first like discarded sailcloth. Only their faces showed, burned so dark they appeared black. Although none of them were able to sit up, two of them beckoned weakly as they stared up at their rescuers. A crew member from the steamer unrolled a rope ladder down the side of the ship and then clambered down, balancing a cask of water on his shoulder. For the next few minutes, the five men took turns drinking. One of them cupped his fingers over his mouth after each turn, as though to ensure no water trickled back out. Jeremy could see them talking, but could not hear over the steamer's rumbling engines what language they used. The white man listened attentively, asked a few questions, and then clambered back up the ladder to head toward the bridge. Jeremy watched him in the cabin below, sorry, cabin there, reporting to the captain. The captain's face was obscured by a harsh streak of sun on the window, leaving only his white uniform facing Mombasa, their destination. At no point did the captain turn toward the stranded men. After what seemed a long wait, the crew member reappeared at the head of the ladder. He did not climb down this time, but just lowered another cask of water on a rope yelled some last words down to the Mohammedans, pointed emphatically twice in a westerly direction, and then rolled the, up the ladder. The engines surged, and the ship chugged away. Surprised, Jeremy watched the Dow bump off the steamer's side and twist in its wake. He stopped a crew member walking by. Where are they trying to get to? Get to, said the purser. Those poor buggers. Dar es Salaam, sir. They ran out of water two days ago. They're lucky we stumbled onto them. Will they be all right? What? Them? Here he would be working for the British, a detail about his employment that he rather regretted. They frequently repeated questions as though shocked at the rest of the world's lack of basic comprehension. Already he had met several men who each spoke with as much stiff-necked propriety as though the papers to the whole of the ever-expanding British Empire were secreted about his clothing. The titles to the Suez Canal in Canada stuck down his collar. Uganda and Nigeria tucked into his socks. Singapore and Australia snug along his thighs, India supporting the small of his back, British East Africa, Rhodesia, and all the rest in his armpits. No matter what exotic sights passed by, no matter who tried to interact with him, the man's expression stayed internal as he struggled not to perspire on the paperwork. Why, they're Arabs, the purser said, surprised. They'll be fine, sir. Like camels they are be able to deal without water much longer than you or I could. Pausing, the purser leaned forward to add confidentially, You know, those people still buy and sell slaves in this day and age. That boat could be heading into port to pick up part of a caravan and auction them off in Persia. He shook his head. Inhuman what they do. Jeremy took one last look astern at the dow getting smaller in the distance, bouncing in the steamer's wake. Three of the men had struggled up into a sitting position, turned to watch the boat steam away. The distance made it impossible to see their expressions. That's it. Thanks.
Hello. Um, I was given questions to answer um, in part of this reading. The first question was, where did the idea of the book come from? So I will read you the author's note. A German citizen named Eugene Weidman abducted a distant cousin of mine in Paris in 1937. For more than two years in Europe, Britain, and the United States, it was a flashy headline news story. The case fascinated me, so I set out to write a nonfiction book. I did all the requisite research. I traveled to Paris and Berlin. I had done this kind of writing before. But because I became far more interested in my fictional characters and less in the real people, I had a problem, except for a few of the real people. The lawyers are real. Colette is real. Janet Flanner is real. Aurora San is real. And indeed, they were all part of the real story. The rest are from my imagination. Uh, this is the first part of the first page. Some days, I'm too angry for words. Those are the days when I can't get to my writing table, when I don't bother to dress, when I stay in my ratty blue chenille bathrobe and shuffle around the house in my slippers. Those days I eat yogurt out of the container and drink too much coffee, sometimes too much whiskey. I read the newspaper and carry on conversations with myself about the dismal state of the universe. Over the years, people have tried to assure me that as I grow older, I will become less angry, more accepting of the stupidity I see on our planet. This has not proved to be true. Sometimes, to ease the tension, I'll read a mystery, hoping to be fooled. Often, I waste time daydreaming. But I have a job to do, a column to compose, so eventually I'll hunker down and begin writing. Then it gets interesting. There is a shift in my mind and my body. Love takes over. My pen begins to tickle my passion for words, and I squirm with pleasure. I still love to use a fountain pen, love the way the smooth nib pushes a stream of blue ink across the paper, making letters, making words, trying to make sense of the world. I would ask then why I chose this section. Um, it, I feel that it gives the reader uh, the essence of my primary character. You either like her and are cur curious about what is going to happen, or wonder, can I live with her throughout the book, or even bother? Um, so the next part. In 1933, I had just traveled across the sea to the second floor of the Paris Courier's editorial office. It was midnight. I remember entering Bedlam. It reminded me of a George Bellows painting of an action-packed boxing ring and arena ochres, grays, an occasional spot of color. Cigarette, cigar, and pipe smoke was hanging in the air, adding its aroma to a miasma of damp paper and stale ink. It made my eyes water. The reporters were working at several large, scratched coffee and beer ringed oak tables that made a square in the middle of the room. Over the tables dangled bare light bulbs that were swaying in a slow motion to the noise and the bustle. There was too much smoke and too little light. The rewrite men were sitting at battered desks haphazardly placed around the room, banging away at rackety typewriters. Even though it was a blazing hot summer night, most of the men wore fedoras. They had shirt sleeves roughly rolled up, some with their cigarette packs stored in a fold, the top buttons of their shirts undone, their ties loosely knotted. Cigarettes were burning and ashtrays were hanging from their mouths. My unremarkable black trousers were sticking to my legs and my wilting white blouse was a mistake. 
The sweat made it stick to my back and stomach, making my brassiere and breasts obvious, and my feet were swollen and sweating in a new pair of flat-heeled black shoes. I stood transfixed, actually scared, at the top of the stairs and scanned the room. So the book goes on to um, near towards the end. Um, the, as you can gather, I hope, that the character, Rose, is looking back on her life. 52 years later, I left Paris. No, 52 years ago, I left Paris. Reading those notes has forced me to remember things that I would rather forget and also things that I'm delighted to be reminded of. Yes, today, some illusions have been shattered. Some are surprisingly honest. I'm going to take a break, make a cup of tea. While waiting for the water to boil, I turn on the radio and out comes an exaggerated waltz, Strauss, of course. With a red pillow as my partner, I waltz around the kitchen table, gliding to the music on my old polished wood floors. I fill the emptiness with memories. I dance. I try to remember the truth. I dance. I try to avoid the reality of my age. I dance. I am afraid of death. I dance and weep. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Jesse Browner. I'm the author of Everything Happens Today. It's uh, my fifth book, but my first for, with Europa. And uh, I have to say, having published books over the past 20 something years, it was by far my best publishing experience. <laughs> and um, I would recommend it to anybody who uh, doesn't need to earn a living at it. <laughs> um, uh, we, we were asked to explain how we came to this book. Um, I would say <clears throat> the novel that I wrote before this one uh, was the uh, last 12 hours in the life of a Roman gem general who was uh, condemned to death. And um, what I discovered was that um, writing a book that is confined to, to 12 hours was so exciting and so challenging uh, that I wanted to do it again. I had been looking for uh, uh, a story about uh, my first love as a teenage boy and I had been planning to spread it out over the course of an entire summer and instead what I did was I took the 12 hours in which uh, my protagonist returned to New York for a summer break and I made that the entire novel and I threw everything else away. So the, the, the uh, section I'm going to read uh, is fairly near the beginning of the book. The only thing we know right now about our protagonist is that he's, his name is Wes. He's 17 years old, he lives in Greenwich Village and he has just made the worst mistake of his life, but we don't yet know what it is. He's, he's been up all night, uh, he, get, he gets home at dawn, he sleeps for a few hours, and this is when he wakes up in the late morning. The bedroom was now flooded with light that felt like a thin, noxious vapor. It was a wintry light, but it was a long way to winter. The days were still too long, too warm, too inviting. Wes longed for the winter, when it was safe to shut oneself away. He loved waking up and going to school and coming home in the dark, the privacy of walking alone in a twilit street in the cold, the lonely romance of winter sounds, wind whisking at the bare tree branches, dry leaves scudding along an unswept sidewalk, the muffling that descends before a snowfall. What he hated was the summer, things that were bright and open and shadowless, he hated waking up in the sunlight, the skimpy clothes, the endless twi hazy twilights. He hated the way the village streets remained crowded deep into the evening with people wandering around aimlessly in cargo shorts and sports bras, joylessly anticipating their first walk, their first drink, a walk along the river with the family, 
some stupid night on the town. Wes thought of Brave New World, a backup candidate for his European lit paper, and the deep sense of kinship he'd felt with Helmholtz Watson as he rejoiced at being exiled to the Falklands. Helmholtz had been offered his choice of any island in the world, Hawaii, Tahiti, the Caribbean, but he asked to be sent somewhere with bad weather, somewhere with lots of winds and storms, just as Wes would have. A place where you could spend all winter holed up with your books, your notebooks, your thoughts. All he'd ever wanted, as far back as he could remember, was to be left alone, where the mind can expand to fill the vast silence, where a man can find peace from chatter and temptation and opinion. A one-room stone cottage with small leaded windows and a large fireplace, glacial runoff to bathe in, unpolluted, unobstructed views for the eye to linger upon in those blank moments before inspiration strikes. In the morning, black coffee from a mocha pot and a solid wedge of, blackberry, of black bread spread thick with creamery butter and lingonberry jam. At night, a roaring fire, a mutton chop charred in the brazier, a peaty single malt, a pipe, maybe an old radio for the dramas and sports scores. Where, Wes wondered, on that rocky volcanic plain, would he find a steady supply of firewood, or coffee, whisk whiskey, tobacco, mutton? Wes would have to be realistic if he were to survive and work. After all, writers in the real world do not have the luxury of being exiled by benevolent dictatorships. They have to survive by their own wits. Either you find a way to live on the cheap, or you sell yourself into lifelong drudgery and compromise in advertising or academia. Wes planned to pull a Helmholtz, but he thought that it might be better to start off somewhere more temperate to begin with until he'd honed his survival skills. Somewhere like Newfoundland or the Highlands of Scotland maybe, where he could trap grouse and grow winter barley and drive into the village once a week for supplies and a pint of bitter, whatever that was, at the local pub. And where he could roam the scented gorse in rubber boots with a fowling piece on his hip and a brown lab at his heels. But even then, where was he to get the money for rent, the car, the dog, the shotgun, the boots? How long would he have to work in this fallen world just so that he could escape it? His father, after all, had pandered his entire life to a similar dream. And just look at where that had gotten him. A loveless marriage, indifferent kids, a job he hated, exile to the basement. He couldn't even afford to live in a place of his own, which would have suited everybody. It was no wonder he was such a loser. Thank you. Now, we're, we're here to answer any questions that you may have, and so if you would like to, uh, any of the, the renowned authors or myself, if there's something that you would like to talk about, yes? Here, here's a microphone. <laughs> um, I want to ask Audrey Schoen, mm -hmm. did you feel that when you are infatuated with these foreign and alien places that you must visit them or, or do you read about them and reimagine them or how do you realize these places? Um, great question, thank you. Uh, the, my first book, which was about the Arctic, uh, I just read about uh, and afterwards, once the book was accepted for publication, uh, I went there, and it was one of the weirdest experiences I've ever had because I had uh, lived in this world mentally for many years, and to it was really what I mentioned. <laughs> it was really freaky. The only thing I hadn't sort of uh, thought of is that uh, the percentage of alcoholics who live up there. That, that was a surprising thing, and the size of the windows, which were very small. Um, but other than, you know, so I, I tend to, um, uh, but now, now I tend to more visit beforehand, uh, but I still do a lot of research. And I'm just one of those people who I learn better by reading than by, um, than by being there. It says something sad about me, I'm sure. Uh, Mr. Carroll, a question for you, if I may. Yes. Actually, two, but the first has an answer, it would just be three or five words. 
The second, a little more open-ended. The first is, what was the memoir that you paid a dollar for and became a big bestseller? And then I'll get to a, to a more open-ended one. Uh, there was a, it was a memoir. Yes, right, you said. By a woman, and there had been, a, in the mid-70s, there were congressional investigations about crime in America, organized crime. And there was testimony that Sam Giancana, who was the head of the crime group in Chicago, had a conduit to President Kennedy in the mm -hmm. 1960s. And they subpoenaed a woman oh. whose name was Judith Exner. Yeah. And she said um, that she was introduced to Sam Giancana by Frank Sinatra, who she had been having an affair with, and also to John Kennedy, who she had an affair with, but that these were all separate. There was, she was not a conduit for, for any information. And um, the, the agent that represented the book uh, wanted a lot of money for it. And because it was John Kennedy, most of the publishers in New York wanted nothing to do with it, even though it clearly was commercial. And he came to me at Grove, said, you know, you're, you'll, Grove would publish something like this, which is true. And he wanted a lot of money, but I learned that he had a first serial deal. He had sold first serial rights to the National Enquirer for $100,000. But the book had to be published for him to get the money. And so uh, I read it, and, and I thought this could be published. And he called back and said, you know, I'm expecting a big offer. And I said, I'm going to get, get you $100,000 for this book. But I'm not going to pay you the National Enquirer well. And he was furious. Yes. But he said, how much are you paying? And I said, I'll give you a dollar. And we published the book. And William Sapphire wrote an entire column just about the book, praising it, because it criticized people he wanted criticized. <laughs> and, it, and it was very successful. I mean, she, there's a whole other story about her on tour, which was just a nightmare. But it was a very successful book. And the advance was, in fact, $1. I really meant that I thought it would be a three-word answer, and you mentioned Judith Exner. I didn't connect that to the memoir, so my apologies. Let me ask you quickly the more open-ended question, which it may not be well thought out. I just thought of it while you were speaking before about the challenges of independent publishers with small budgets vis-a-vis -vis huge conglomerate publishers. Um, you know, the, actually, as it happens, the uh, Oakland Athletics were just... Um, uh, uh, maybe the Yankees were just playing, the, I'm, I'm not sure where they were playing, but they were just playing the Yankees. I can't help rooting for the Yankees, but I'm very aware that the Oakland A's, with a budget, may, a, a, maybe a third, now that's already a much bigger percentage, but it's still a fraction of the Yankees' budget, are doing slightly better than them and clearly know how to spend money better. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, um, and obviously there was a book about the Oakland days as well. I think that was the Moneyball book. Um, are, are there any lessons from the way Oakland and a few other smaller budget teams have managed to be competitive or better vis-a-vis -vis much huger budget teams? Are there any lessons for independent publishers in that? Well, one of the lessons, certainly for the independent bookstores, is that all this pressure has made them become far better retailers than they were before. So the ones that are still in business, uh, Sarah McNally, McNally's store in Soho, for example, they're, they're much better than most, most independent bookstores of you know, 10 or 15 years ago. And to some degree, I think it's true with, with some of the independent um, the independent publishers, that they find a niche that, that, that they can exploit and they can dominate. But, it's, but the, um, the competition is very difficult. I mean, usually when um, they have books that are successful, it's, it's, there's a, it's a combination of circumstance that you can't really rely on. Where with the big publishers, with the amount of money that they spend, the books that they can commission, that they have a steady flow of product, particularly the nonfiction product. It's much easier to sell nonfiction because you're selling a subject. If you're selling fiction, you're selling, you know, the, the ending has to work. Um, uh, it's why Hachette just bought uh, Perseus. You know, they want, you know, just it was announced today or yesterday 
that, um, and Hachette is the outfit that's having this battle with, with Amazon at the moment. But what they really needed to do was the security of a big nonfiction list. And one of the things some smart, smaller publishers will concentrate in certain areas in nonfiction, which tends to be much safer to do. Most independent publishers at the startups, they're editorially driven by people who think of books in terms of, of fiction. And it's the most difficult to do, it's the most competitive, and it's the most likely to put you out of business. For, for Mr. Carroll, given that you, what you just said, um, what's the level of editorial support for the writer? How many years are you willing to work with a writer and how much support is the company in general willing to the have? Europa? Yes. You should probably ask well, uh, these people. Maybe Ms. Shulman. I mean, it sounds like it took you years to write your book. Did you have even flow of uh, editorial support? Sorry. Um, I, I, yeah. Uh, in terms of my experience, yes. uh, editors now are much more acquisition editors, uh, and they don't tend to edit. Uh, Kent is an in incredible exception. Um, so uh, uh, editors, the name generally doesn't mean that they edit, which is very strange. Um, I've had different experiences. I've always had good editors, and um, with Penguin, they were excellent. And with Europa, I have Kent, which who's terrific. So I've never had a, a problem, although I've heard many writers that do have big problems where uh, books go are, are published with lots of errors, obviously have not been been um, edited at all. So but I'm just been very fortunate too. Um, I've had the experience of being published by uh, Europa, a very small independent publisher and also by a large, uh, large publisher. And um, while it's true that the editorial uh, support was important at, uh, at Europa and, and extremely personalized, uh, even more important is what comes after the editing. Um, in, in a large company uh, that's publishing 40 or 50 or 60 or 100 titles a year, Unless you happen to be one of their big titles for the season, uh, you may you can be very easily lost in the shuffle. Uh, it's not only uh, marketing; it's also the sales force. They go out uh, to their to buyers, you know, at Barnes and Noble or at Amazon, and also to the independent bookstores. And they only have a certain amount of time to sell their catalog. And what they do is they tend to focus on the few big titles of that season. And it's very, very easy to get entirely lost. Um, also, maybe to have a publicist who, who doesn't understand your book and therefore will, will not make much of an effort to publicize it. My experience at, at, at Europa was so positive because everything was incredibly hands-on. Uh, I never felt that uh, any of the, the, the marketing or publicity Publicity people were distracted. They were focused on my book. And um, the, the proof is that uh, this book sold the same number of books as, as uh, when I was published by a much larger publisher. And yet, what I hope is that, uh, although I don't know and I have never dared to ask, is that because, is because the other publishers paid so much more, they, they lost a lot more on those books. Yes? Um, I, I had a question, I guess, for all three of the authors, which is that um, I feel like in the readings that you gave, you each had a very particular sense of your character's relationship to the story. And I was just wondering if each of you would be able to give a little bit about the difference uh, for you, your interest in the story, and the character's interest, and just what that kind of experience is like, where maybe you and your character that you, you know, put at the center of your novel, sort of maybe where your paths diverge or, or uh, coincide. But I was just really curious about that because it seemed like you all had very specific ideas of who your characters were. So how we are different or similar to our characters is somewhat of your question? Just, or how, like your experience of the story, of writing the story, and, and then the characters sort of 
going through that story. I guess I was just interested in sort of seemingly ironic or non-ironic distance for your character or for you. Okay. Um, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll just, I, mean, I just figure we're going like that That's way. Yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, I mean, unless you guys, <laughs> no, you go. <laughs> I'm trying to process an answer at <laughs> no, all. You are. Um, uh, for me, when I'm uh, writing best, uh, uh, I, I feel like I'm watching my characters, um, and uh, I feel like they almost are telling me the story, um, and it's a, uh, it's a wonderful thing. The, the problem is always to get to that point where, where I feel that experience, you know, where that happens. Um, but as, uh, especially with um, a Max in this book, the woman who has Asperger's, um, I could see the world through her eyes. Um, I, could, I could smell the world through her, and that was incredible. I don't know if that quite answers your question, but. Um, I was a visual artist for 25 years before I started to write. So when I look at my story, I see it visually. Um, it's similar, actually. Um, and and I, I watch it as, a, as if it's a movie. And then I begin to write. And in every character, of course, is part of oneself and whether you like it or not. And um, so I, I do that kind of exploring, but I do it visually first. Uh, I'm not sure this will answer your question. Uh, I had started writing, uh, developing the character of Wes. Uh, I thought it was going to be a portrait of myself when I was 17 years old. But what I found to my surprise was I had expected that I was going to be quite hard on myself. In fact, I was, I remembered myself in a very kind of rose-tinted way, and I was much too nice to the character. So what I found was I had to um, uh, hybridize him with, uh, I, I was very lucky to have a, a teenage daughter at the time. So for all the, all the, the cranky stuff and all the irrational stuff, um, I was able to, I had a 17 year old right in front of me every day. So I, I was able to bring those two together, you know, he, everything that's nice about him is me and everything that's cranky about him is her and, and uh, I'd never say that when she's in the room so you didn't hear me say that. <laughs> anyway, she's now 21 and she's, she's gotten over she's it. So. <laughs> I wondered where you uh, get your new writers. Do you only work with uh, literary agents that you know or with all of them? How do you find new writers? Almost, well, th either through agents or through, we buy, um, um, many of the books we publish are European from uh, the United Kingdom or for the continent from France, Italy, Germany. And when we buy from um, the UK, for example, about half the books come through agents, but about half are sold to us by British publishers who own the rights. They'll, buy with a, they'll commission a book, say, and they'll buy world English language rights. They'll only publish in the UK, and they'll sell the rights to the other parts of the English-speaking world to other publishers. Um, we don't, and in the United States, it's principally through agents, and agents it's, it's a, serve a very important purpose for publishers. They've, they've made, there's a pre-selection done. There's certain agents that you know and you can be, you're aware of what they, what they take on, the quality of it, um, which is, is very helpful. It, it makes it a much more efficient process. It's also for a publisher or an editor, if you're working with a writer, it's best not to have financial dealings directly with, with the author. They're not very good at it, for one thing. And um, it's, it, embarrassing questions can rise, where if there's gonna be a dispute or there's some negotiation, much better to do it with the agent and leave the, leave the author out of it. Um, when I was at Carol and Graff and we first started, there, we would accept unsolicited manuscripts. There was a slush pile, and they would come in by the hundreds. 
and I used to read them on Sunday afternoons, and I stopped because it was so sad. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was it just, it was terrible. I was there all my, by myself in my office reading these stories that was sent by somebody, and it, and it was her grandmother who was dying, and this, this story she wrote, and she'd like to be published before she dies. Um, so agents serve a multitude of purposes, and it's also better for the author as well as for the publisher. I have a question. Where do you see the company in five years? Well, I think that if we could do what we're doing now in five years, with perhaps be um, with, a, with a larger backlist, where there's steady, predictable revenue, so there's more economic security. But I think if we can continue to publish uh, the writers we're presently publishing and have, such as the three uh, writers at the table, uh, people of that quality and books of that quality, we'll be very happy. Um, we're, we're, I don't think anyone associated with this company thinks they're going to get really rich. I think it's done for, for very different reasons. And the extra financial satisfactions are, are extremely rewarding. If we have no more questions, we're, oh, I beg your pardon, I'm so sorry. This is a quick comment. Oh, sorry. Um, in the past year and a half, I've bought six Europa titles, like not knowing anything about them and not knowing anything about the authors. I loved every single one, so that's it. Thank you. I think that is the perfect comment to close on, and it really is, I mean, the work of Europa Editions and Kent and his wonderful writers, it's just so important to have, to continue to have those independent voices. And long may the reign of independent publishers be. And I think one thing about independent publishing, that there's a certain ability to be so much more flexible than conglomerate publishers. And that individual attention, I think, that Jesse highlighted, that you so often don't get when you're with a conglomerate publisher, particularly if you are labeled a mid-list author. And that just doesn't happen with a company like Europa Editions. It has been... Our great honor, as I said before, to have Kent and Europe Editions. And I want to remind you all that we have these wonderful books that you all heard extra extract from, The Last Train to Paris, Three Weeks in December, and Everything Happens Today. They will be on sale. But before we conclude and invite you to join us for wine and cheese, um, we would like to make a presentation. And this is Meg Stanton, our program assistant. And so first of all, we are going to present Kent with a citation and library membership. Oh. Honorary <laughs> membership for... <laughs> this is honorary membership for the rest of your life. <laughs> or as long as you're in New York City. <laughs> Next, we are going to present to Audrey And again, thank you very much. Lifetime library membership. So I do hope you'll come back and use the facilities. Thank Michelle, th again, thank you so much. And finally, Jesse. And this is very handy because Jesse said to me before the program started, oh, I used to be a member of this library. But I know he works long hours, but hopefully you will be able to come back, particularly as you have a lifetime to do so. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you all for attending this evening. As I said, this is the last of our lectures for the current season, and it's just been uh, a wonderful way to end. And so I hope you'll come back and join us in the fall when we'll have a new series of lectures. But in the meantime, I'm going to ask you to thank our uh, panel tonight for their wonderful and eloquent discussion. Thank you.